Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula, and when I'm not intentionally driving death-proof style in the cars donning baby on board signs, I'm here at the Wolfula reviewing movies. Alrighty, here it is, baby. My review of the most anticipated horror film of 2018, Halloween. Uh, again. Yeah, I already technically reviewed this flick when it came out, but I didn't have clips to go all that in-depth, so I kept that first vid spoiler-free. Consequently, this video will be super long and heavy on spoilers throughout, and I won't be bothering with saving spoiler talk for the end with a warning and a little time code you can skip to like a lot of my other vids. So, if you want to hear my thoughts on the film but don't want spoilers, go back and watch that old review, then decide if you want to watch the movie based on that, and then come back to this video and give me an extra view. It'll really help me game YouTube's algorithm. Before I get to the actual review, though, let's talk about the long, long road to getting here. 2018's Halloween, which is a sequel that really is just plainly called Halloween, even though the film before last was also just called Halloween, has been a long time in the making, and it's been divisive amongst fans before it even released. The 11th Halloween began as a 3D sequel to Rob Zombie's films, which just sounds like it would have been fucking great. Wearing those glasses in a mostly empty theater and having hobo Michael Myers pop out at me in the third dimension, oh boy, I would have creamed my shorts. Then of course, when that fucking obviously failed, it was announced later that a Halloween reboot was in the works, tentatively titled Halloween Returns. Every sequel's a return. Whatever, the plot of the reboot would have been about Michael Myers escaping death row years after the events of 1 and 2, which is kind of weird since you can't give a trial to a dude who doesn't talk, and this film would have been helmed by the makers of Piranha 3 Double D. We dodged a bullet there. Of course, there were many other attempts to pitch an 11th Halloween film that are lost to time. Platinum Dunes even pitched their own take because apparently Michael Bay has to stick his dick in every slasher franchise at least once. I think this concept art was symbolic. Point is, a long time past between Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 and the 11th film we eventually got, and for good reason. The Halloween series was left in a weird place with a lot of timelines to address. Zombie's then new timeline ended with Michael and Lori having some kind of shared violent psychosis via horse fetishism, and all the characters seemed to die. So H2 left a conundrum of where the series could go next. The franchise had recently shot the starting over wad with the remake. <laughs> And the original series has a mess of timelines on its own, with the Thorn Trilogy and H2O timeline branching out after the original Halloween 2. Also, unrelated anthology experiment, Halloween 3 is in the mix. Stop it! You know, for a series as simple as a killer on the loose on Halloween, they really got Legend of Zelda up in this bitch with the timeline. Point is, continuing the Halloween series was difficult, to say the least. The Halloween series isn't typical for slasher horror films in that it tends tends to have more of a storyline and a cast of characters that would need to be carried over from sequel to sequel that would just lead to fumbles down the line, like Tina. <laughs> and Busta Rhymes, oh god. Trick or treat. So yeah, if a new film was gonna be made, it seems like it would be pretty much forced to go back to the original film's roots, and I know some of you at home are like, how about just not making sequels? You can't kill the boogeyman. Hey, if I like a thing, I wanna see it continued. There are bad sequels, but there are also great sequels, some arguably better than the films that spawn them. Like, a sequel can even just be good, not better than the original, and still be worth it for being good in its own way. And sure, most horror sequels are total shit, but there are some worthwhile ones when put in the right hands, and even in a bad sequel, I love villains like Michael Myers so much, I'm willing to even take them in a shit film. I've watched Halloween Resurrection so many times, it's so shitty, but I have. I've even watched it with the commentary track on, it has fucking Michael Myers in it, I'm all about it. I'll take a chance on a Halloween sequel no matter what, as long as Michael Myers isn't a fucking smelly hobo. Die. If it sucks, it sucks, and if you don't want a sequel, you don't have to see it. Point of this sequel defense, though, is even after really not liking the last few Halloween films, I was still waiting for a new Halloween movie, like a faithful wife waiting for her husband to come back from the war, but for years, a sequel never came. 
Then, after years of false starts, Blumhouse Productions, which was becoming prolific in indie horror, was announced to be developing a new Halloween sequel, and John Carpenter was producing. Carpenter never bothered with any of the sequels past three, even when his career took a nosedive, but he was now back in an advisory role and was even considering doing the music, which was intriguing to me. Then there was the announcement of who was to be helming the 11th film. David Gordon Green was directing it and co-writing it with comedic actor slash writer Danny McBride, which, you know, was unexpected. The duo had a lot of background in comedy and none in horror, but they've done some great stuff and some bad stuff. David Gordon Green, as a well-respected director, gave the sequel credibility to me early on, though. He wasn't just some random dude who directed some music videos. He's directed a lot of well-received films, and Danny McBride seemed to be a real fan of the franchise with a lot of enthusiasm towards being involved with a Halloween film, and he also seemed to get what worked about the original film. So, eventually, I was sold on these two, and even more sold once Jamie Lee Curtis was brought on board, and I was anxiously waiting to see what they'd come up with. Halloween was my most anticipated flick of 2018. I had high expectations for this little horror sequel, and now, finally, I'm gonna be talking about what worked and what really didn't work for me about Halloween 2018. Starting with the title. It's confusing, but let's move on to the plot now, I guess. Early on, the story of Halloween concerns Aaron and Dana, played by Jefferson Hall and Rian Reese, respectively. Two journalists from the UK, actually, they're true crime podcasters. We're making a podcast and- We're investigative uh... journalists. This is my first complaint with the movie. These characters didn't need to be podcasters. It feels like an attempt to be topical with serial and the like getting big in recent years and maybe have a little bit of commentary on the state of criminal investigations in the media today. But I think it's just going to end up dating this film and having them be podcasters is just kind of lame. It's a small gripe, but it's something that should have been altered for the sake of this being a horror film. It doesn't do the subject of Aaron's and Dana's story any favors in regards to being taken seriously and not being treated with the same level of respect as a BuzzFeed article. Aaron and Dana's subject being, of course, Michael Myers himself, who the duo visits at Smith's Grove Sanitarium for an interview. Yeah, they chose a guy who has never spoken to anybody for more than 50 years as the subject of their audio show. Really did their research. He can't speak. He just chooses not to. It's stated pretty plainly by Aaron while recording his podcast, but this new Halloween, well, takes place in a new timeline. We're here today to interview a patient that's spent the last 40 years in captivity. Which is nothing new for this series, and was expected, but even more controversially amongst fans is the fact that the original Halloween 2's events didn't happen. The Thorn Trilogy and H2O both treated Halloween 2's events as happening. Halloween 2 is a well-regarded sequel amongst fans, but the new Halloween's version of The Night He Came Home is quite different. After Michael is shot out the window by Loomis, he doesn't just fade into the Halloween night or pursue his sister to a hospital. Instead, Michael is quickly cast captured, and remains captured for 40 years. Not a whole lot of room for killing in that time. Michael isn't exactly as prolific in this timeline. It's kind of lame, and this movie even references the lameness of it briefly. I mean, what, a couple people getting killed by one guy with a knife is not that big of a deal. I feel like Michael could have been on the loose as a boogeyman for 40 years, but at the same time, the idea of Michael maintaining the silent, expressionless thing for 40 years, giving up his entire life to this, is eerie, not gonna lie. And it makes reintroducing the killer a little simpler. So it really is give and take. But if you think the most controversial thing about taking Halloween 2 out of the timeline is whether or not Michael just stands around for 40 years, well then, brother, you got another thing coming. But I'll get to that later. At Smith's Grove Sanitarium, Aaron and Dana meet Dr. Sartain, played by Halick Bilgener, Michael's new Dr. Loomis. Dr. Loomis was the only one to see him in the wild. Oh, definitely more on him later. Much, much later. Aaron and Dana honestly picked the worst time to do an in-depth story on Michael Myers. For one, it's close to Halloween, so their podcast would come out after Halloween is over, so less people would give a shit. And the next day, Michael's going to be transferred from Smith's Grove to a maximum security prison facility known as Glass Hill. We were hoping to have this opportunity before he's transferred to the new facility. Glass Hill is far less accommodating. Glass Hill is the pit of hell. 
I assume the name is ironic. So yeah, Dana and Aaron are on a bit of a time crunch for this podcast, to say the least. You gotta make your Halloween content like a month in advance, which is advice I myself never follow. I really do feel like Aaron and Dana are just the worst podcasters ever, and the movie doesn't really offer any credibility to them beyond the equipment they carry and the ominous words they say into said equipment. Iron bars and barbed wire that separate them are both strong and sharp. The metaphysical lines of blood and slight. What's their show called? How big's their audience? Do they have, like, a loot crate sponsor funding their operation? Give me the deets! I know these characters are just glorified exposition. They even make the obligatory trip to Judith Myers' grave, with flashback clips just to establish again how Michael began, but the podcasters could have been fleshed out with a little bit more than just, they're making a podcast. We're making a podcast. Did they even need to go to the grave for a podcast? What soundbite are they going to get from dirt? Whatever, this movie ultimately is not about making the shittiest podcast about Michael Myers ever. It's about Michael Myers himself, and the podcasting duo meets him right away in the middle of Smith's Grove's giant chessboard. Aw oh, man, why didn't they model their courtyard after Hungry Hungry Hippos? Now that's a thinking man's game. Now, with introducing Michael Myers, the film doesn't shy away from making the obvious Obvious crystal clear. Michael Myers is old now, giving probably the clearest, longest look at him in broad daylight as an adult ever. Michael honestly looks like a grandpappy now, balding, a beard. Ironically, in his old age, he looks a lot like Dr. Loomis, except for the fact that Michael's eye is fucked up from Lori poking it with a hanger. A bit of continuity that the series never really bothered with before. Michael just grows his eyes back in every other movie. The film handles Michael's age well, ultimately. It's never referenced much or really joked about. Yeah, you tell him to look for a guy with a cane and Alzheimer's. The film just shows an aged Michael Myers up front, and you either accept the killer in the slasher movie you're watching is old or don't, but I think James Jude Courtney, who portrays Michael Myers in this film, does a convincing job of selling an older Michael Myers as still being a credible threat. I mean, Tom Cruise is nearly Michael Myers' age, and he's still fucking running around and shit, so Michael Myers may look aged, but he can still have the physicality of a killer so long as he's got his cholesterol sorted out. Besides, the shape is more than just a fleshy body. He'd be nothing without his mask, and the film does an excellent job of establishing this when Aaron takes out the supposed original mask that he borrowed from the district attorney's office. Podcasters have some insane amounts of authority, evidently. Point is, Aaron wants to elicit a response of some sort from Michael, but beyond a subtle glance, it doesn't happen. Instead, it's made clear that Michael reunited with his mask possesses some otherworldly presence that can only be perceived by his fellow inmates, who shift from being listless to becoming violently arrested Erratic. Say something. The mask is enough to conjure up this larger-than-life, ambiguously supernatural force that the shape has hidden inside himself for decades. The film does a masterful job of establishing Michael Myers today. He's more than just this fella in a mask killing teens. There's an evil inside him that's far more powerful and primal that words just couldn't do justice. Say something! Before I move on to the rest of the plot, I gotta give props to the fact that David Gordon Green brought back the long-abandoned opening credits jack-o'-lantern sequence after the cold open, but in an inventive way. Through reverse time lapse, a rotten pumpkin forms into the recognizable jack-o'-lantern of the original, of course signifying an attempt to return to the first film's roots. I really miss the jack-o'-lantern opening, and it does help to make this film feel like an authentic direct sequel to the first film. I also have to hand it to this movie's score. Carpenter actually returned to compose the music for the film alongside his son Cody and his godson Daniel Davies, and the score of this film is incredible. There are plenty of new takes on old classic themes, but some of the standout tracks for me were a haunting reimagining of Laurie Strode's theme and the menacing tune that plays much later when the shape hunts Allison called the Shape Hunts Allison, direct title. Carpenter really delivered on his end. The score of this Halloween is the best since the original, and it really gives this sequel that essential Carpenter touch that's really been missing since he left. The score has tracks that are relentlessly energetic in their sense of menace, and also tracks that are eerily atmospheric. The score has a retro sound while still feeling modern. It's a new classic score and demonstrates that Carpenter still got it as a composer. I'm grateful that he decided 
decided to return at all. It just isn't quite Halloween without him. Returning to the plot, let's talk about the actual main character of the film. Yeah, the podcasters thankfully are not. Jamie Lee Curtis returned to reprise the role of Laurie Strode. This is allowed by the new timeline, of course. She's not dead from an unseen car wreck or from a rushed, shitty death that's irrelevant to the rest of the rushed, shitty movie that it happened in. Of course, this time, Halloween 2 isn't in the timeline. Now, for those of you mostly unfamiliar with the series lore, you're probably wondering, why does it matter if Halloween 2 didn't happen? Well, Halloween 2 might actually be the most consequential film in the series story-wise. In Halloween 2, it's revealed that Michael and Lori are long-lost siblings. That girl, that Strode girl, that's Michael Myers' sister. This was the backbone of every Halloween film story going forward. Michael is ultimately hunting down his family. He likes killing random folks, sure, but his main concern is familicide, first and foremost. Be it going after Lori or Lori's descendants. The Rob Zombie remake leaned heavy on this Halloween 2 revelation. Halloween H2O saw Michael go cross-country to find Lori under an assumed identity. Though, I don't really know why Michael waited 20 years to do that when all it took was looking at an old man's file and driving for a few days. Point is, Halloween 2 isn't just a well-liked entry in the franchise, it also dictated the direction of all future Michael Myers films. So yeah, not acknowledging it beyond a meta joke is a little controversial for fans. Wasn't it her brother who like cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Honestly, though, I'm fine with Michael Myers and Lori not being related. It makes them easier to ship. But also, I'm fine with it because Michael Myers works best as this unreasonable, inhuman being. By giving him some underlying motivation, even if it isn't fully understood, it's still putting Michael Myers in a box, limiting his potential. By having Michael kill his sister for no reason and never stopping this desire to kill, all the while expressing no emotional response, you got pure evil right there. Something a bit more fascinating and open-ended. Michael Myers stalks people purely on a whim and kills them for no apparent reason. He wears that mask to further obscure his humanity. Ideally, you shouldn't be able to predict what he does next, like going after a sibling, or be able to discern anything about him that could generate a psychological profile beyond, he likes to kill, I guess. And he concluded he was nothing more than pure evil. To me, a Halloween film works best when it worries less on the why of what Michael's doing, and more on how the characters react to his actions and are impacted by them. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. I do love Halloween 2 for what it is, it's a fan favorite sequel, but to me, it just felt like an extended epilogue to the first movie that happened to reveal a juicy detail about Michael's and Laurie's relationship. Carpenter himself admitted to regretting the twist, and that it was brought about by writer's block. And I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. I was really disappointed in it. Mm. Okay, so this defense of removing Halloween 2 from current canon is getting long in the tooth. Point is, I just prefer the idea of Michael being this blank entity that just kills. A pure human boogeyman that you can't understand. It's just scarier to me and more relatable than being related to him. Let's get back to Lori. The podcasters bribe Lori to lend her voice for an interview to the tune of $3,000 cash. How does $3,000 sound? Again, I'm wondering what their fucking show is like and where they're getting all this funding to blow on what winds up being a five-minute chat with somebody asking if they believe in the boogeyman. I read you quoted. You don't believe in the boogeyman? I believe in Michael Myers, a deranged serial killer. Lori herself is isolated from society, a recluse. After her run-in with Michael 40 years ago, she let it take over her life and became obsessed with the belief that he would escape again and come after her. Actually, I kind of wonder why they put Michael back in Smith's Grove and not some other distant facility. If he could escape from there the first time, what's stopping him from doing it again? Oh, whatever, he never did escape again or even seemed to attempt to escape in all that time, which means the interview she has with the podcasters addressing his transfer soon is also addressing the fact that Lori very likely wasted her life and failed everyone around her, which has to sting. Two failed marriages, rocky relationship with your daughter and granddaughter. 
This kind of retreads Halloween H2O's premise a bit, honestly. Lori's a shut-in alcoholic who's fixated on this scary dude and alienates her loved ones with the obsession. Sounds a lot like me, actually. And I'm a basket case. Thing is, in H2O, Lori's a fuddy-duddy headmistress who spends most of the movie, uh, sad. <laughs> In what is essentially Halloween H4O, they have a better, more interesting take on the concept. Lori is pissed off the whole movie, and Curtis really puts her all in performing her iconic role with fiery intensity, and definitely doesn't spend most of it lying in a hospital bed. Lori in this film is a bit of a statement on Dr. Loomis's character, and Michael Myers' effect on people. She's one of the few people to actually survive an encounter with Michael, and even if you live through him, Michael leaves behind a curse, evidently. The the shape never left Lori's mind that night. The trauma from the event always remained, and after a while, she just became angry and bitter over all the time spent with Michael living in her head, like Loomis did, and wanted the mass killer dead by any means necessary. So, Lori is a total survivalist in this flick. She's a crack shot with an extensive collection of firearms who spends her time shooting white-faced mannequins in her backyard, and she's gone to great lengths and with great financial burden to turn her her home into a booby-trapped fortress. On the outside, Lori looks like that innocent girl we met in the first movie as a granny, but on the inside, she's mentally preparing herself for the worst. Like Dr. Loomis before, Lori's done trying to figure out Michael Myers like the podcasters foolishly are. She just wants him dead. There are no new insights or discoveries. Lori is totally resolute in her desire to see Michael as a corpse and is a complete hard ass about it. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape? What the hell do you do that for? So I can kill him. Well, that was a dumb thing to pray for. Hey, trauma makes you wish for some dumb things. She's the immovable object to Michael's unstoppable force, but it's been 40 years and nobody really gets where Lori is coming from, especially her family. This is exactly why we don't reach out. Consequently, Lori has become estranged from her family, and not just because of her fixation, but how far it went. Lori's daughter Karen, played by Judy Greer, aka not Jamie, or thankfully not Josh Hartnett, was taken into foster care because Lori basically made Karen's whole childhood just preparing for this guy escaping from a mental institution and trying to kill her. Yeah, well, it's still less dangerous than being Woody Allen's child. Lori's not gonna be winning no mother of the year awards, though, leaving Karen traumatized, ironically without even meeting Michael. And part of me wonders if Lori just had Karen so she could use her as bait for Michael. Makes you think. I've spent my entire life trying to get over the paranoia and neuroses that she has projected on me. So yeah, the relationship between Lori and Karen is strained to say the least, and Michael's transfer is the wake-up call that tells Lori that she needs to actually start reaching out to her family, or else she won't have anything left. Judy Greer is excellent as Karen, delivering a sweetly melancholic performance and acts as a nice counterbalance to Lori as somebody who just wants to be the best mom she can given the circumstances and escape from the past and instead of dwelling on it. The world is not a dark and evil place. It is full of love and understanding, and I'm not letting your psychotic rants confuse me or convince me otherwise. I just wish there was a bit more with Greer in the film than what's there. Her backstory is pretty interesting. Karen Strode, or Karen Nelson now, for whatever reason still lives in Haddonfield with her husband Ray Nelson, played by Toby Huss, and their daughter Allison, played by Andy Matichek. Despite their estrangement from Lori, the Nelson family is pretty functional, not perfect or anything, but they like each other and make time for each other. No real strain or worries, which is a stark contrast to Lori's loneliness. I honestly have to applaud the casting of Toby Huss's Ray. You've made it into the National Honor Society. That is a very big deal. I just made it to the top of my shop glass making birdhouses and a, a checkerboard made of teak. This is one of the rare times when a father in a Halloween movie isn't a total asshole or entirely absent. Well, Dad an abusive, chain-smoking, methadone addict. Who would attract someone like that? Ray's a nice, likable guy. A goofy father that makes dad jokes. I got peanut butter on my penis. Ew, dad. And is a total outsider when it comes to the whole living in fear of the boogeyman thing. Hey, Lori, this is my home, and I can take care of my own family, all right? 
I know jujitsu. The bus crash. Okay, I'm gonna be going on a bit of a tangent, but one of my chief concerns when Danny McBride was brought on was that this flick would dip heavy in a comedy, despite his reassurances that it wouldn't. For the most part, though, Halloween 2018 is a very serious flick that rarely makes light of its horror. There are jokes, though, which is something the Halloween series doesn't usually do, unless it's Rob Zombie having a character talk about fucking the corpse of a 17-year-old. I heard a story about a couple of meat wagon boys fucking corpse over in Essex. They never had the urge to open night. <laughs> but the humor in Halloween 2018 mostly shows up in places where it's appropriate. You sit still. Well, I was sitting still anyway, what do you mean? Some shit really stands out though, like two cops having a Seinfeld-esque discussion of each other's stakeout meals. Fresh brownie. Okay. Chocolatey homemade brownie, I made that myself. That's, that's like what a five-year-old would eat if they could make their own lunch. It just doesn't really fit, but it's a step up from the incompetent cops in Halloween 5 and their wacky theme song. <laughs> Music is funny, right? Fuck me. Anyway, despite this being the film that got rid of the Myers family connection, this flick still manages to have a strong focus on the Strode family dynamic. Besides killing Michael, Lori wants nothing more than to reconnect with her daughter and to be able to see her granddaughter Allison without it being a secret, but Karen makes efforts to keep this from happening out of fear that Lori will fuck up Allison in the head too. I talked to her yesterday. She's not gonna be able to come, honey, I'm sorry. Really? Allison Nelson is a modern teenage girl in high school, a more worldly counterpart to the original film's Lori. She wants her grandma to be part of her life, but is still put off by Lori's obsessiveness. It took priority over your family. It cost you your family. Andy Matichak delivers a good performance, but upon further viewings, I feel like there isn't a whole lot to Allison as a character, at least in this movie. You know, she's kind of deadpan, her expressions are muted, it kind of just makes her seem really bland. I also feel like she doesn't serve much of a purpose in this movie. She doesn't have an arc like her mom and grandma. Allison is just kind of there to have a teen survivor girl and introduce a bunch of young victims for the most part. There is room for development in the sequels that will no doubt happen, but in this flick, I'm a little disappointed with the character's debut. All right, before I move on to the rest of the plot and finally get back to good old Michael Myers, let's talk about the rest of the cast of victims. I mean, characters. Allison has a handful of friends she surrounds herself with. There's Allison's best friend, Vicky, played by Virginia Gardner, and her boyfriend, Dave, played by Miles Robbins. I don't really get Dave's character. He only gets a few scenes and in one he does the stoner rebel thing dressing like an urban outfitter's threw up on him and in the other he's the red-blooded horny romantic but he winds up fucking off for quite a bit messing with somebody's motorcycle like he didn't need to be around if all he's gonna do is be distracted by a shiny thing in the end you got this tattoo because tonight is the night the one we'll remember for the rest of our lives you are so getting dry fucked tonight I don't know, Dave's relationship with Vicky does at least add some tragic pathos to their deaths that obviously fucking happen, but there isn't even a sex scene. Only nudity is the Judith Myers murder flashback. Rats. Well, at least no nudity means we don't have to see Judy Greer's tits. Oh, I spoke too soon. I wasn't so sure about Vicky as a character at first, until it turned out that she was actually the babysitter of the film. You used to be my favorite, but now you're like my 10th favorite boy that I nanny. Well, they call her a nanny, but whatever, babysitter. When she was first introduced, I didn't really care too much about the Vicky character until it got heavier with her relationship with her boyfriend and especially the kid she babysits, Julian, played by Jabrail Nantambu. If I had some other kind of babysitter, she'd be reading me a story. I wouldn't be up clipping my nasty-ass toenails. Uh-huh, go to bed. The exchanges between the two feel really casual, natural, familiar. Their back and forth is funny and sweet, just seems like a real kid and babysitter, and it really makes me wish Vicky was the actual main character, but, uh, you know, I guess having another babysitter protagonist is a little passe. By the way, you're actually my favorite kid I babysit for. I like you too. Allison also has a boyfriend herself, whose name is Cameron, played by Dylan Arnold. And her boyfriend also has a boyfriend himself named Oscar, played by Drew Scheid. Come here. Mwah. Funny little detail about Cameron is the fact that he's actually the son of Lonnie, a relatively obscure bully from the first flick who got his ass spooked by Loomis. Hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. 
Right. Remember the one time Lonnie punched that cop in the face? Right. That's a cute detail, but what I really want to know is where the fuck is Ben Tramer? He's got to still be alive in this timeline. I just want to know he's safe. I just want to know he's safe. <laughs> But anyway, Cameron appears on the surface to be an upstanding lad and serves as an effective narrative tool to show how Allison is growing up without her grandmother's presence, but in the middle act, Cameron kind of devolves as a character. At the over-the-top high school Halloween rave, which really feels out of place with the rest of the film, Cameron and Allison dress as gender-swapped Bonnie and Clyde, which I guess is cute, but again, it feels weird tone-wise, and Allison doesn't come off as the kind of character who does that kind of quirky, silly shit for social media points. She comes off as the kind of character that would wear one of those shirts that says, this is my costume. At this bombastic event that would never happen on school grounds in a small rural town, Cameron gets all kissy-kissy with a tiger chick because nothing is quite as big of a panty dropper as dressing like a female bank robber. This conflict just feels really forced and ultimately reduces the Cameron character to just being a plot device. A way to get rid of Allison's phone to prevent contact with her family by having Cameron, for some reason, toss her phone into... What is that? Fucking pudding? What the fuck? You're gonna get that. Phones are waterproof. Just, just wash it off. Okay, fine. Buy another one, I guess. Rich bitch. Cameron actually disappears for the rest of the film. He's never killed or nothing. Clearly, this is a setup for him to return in a sequel and possibly redeem himself, but I think it's lazy writing for the character to not do anything for the rest of the film. This is Jimmy all over again. <laughs> So, Cameron in this film just ends up being an asshole that throws a phone into some pudding. Fuck me. Ultimately, I think Halloween 2018 might have one of the strongest casts the series has ever had, and I did like most of the characters. Some of them have their flaws, but they have their charms, too. I really didn't hate anybody in this flick. I didn't even feel like there was that one asshole character put in that you want to see die. A lot of the characters, I didn't even want to see dead at all, but at the end of the day, I want to see some kills. Speaking of which, let's finally get to the inciting incident of the story that leads to the horror. This video is way too fucking long if I'm only just now getting to this part, but let's keep going. Michael's transfer scene might just be my favorite scene in this film. For a scene about an old man getting on a bus, it's surprisingly powerful. The scene intercuts the podcasters listening to an old recording of Dr. Loomis. Dr. Samuel Loomis, January 22nd. 1979. Of course, Donald Pleasance is long dead. Not dead. <laughs> just very much retired. But the voice impersonator this time around is really close, I have to say. My suggestion is termination. Death is the only solution for Michael. The H2O voice actor, Tom Kane, was only passable for a cartoon voice, which is probably why he also played the Loomis parody on Boondocks. For the spawn of Satan, I must destroy you! Yeah. Loomis's monologue after the events of the first Halloween isn't some foreboding bit of exposition. No, he just talks about how he wants Michael Myers, his patient by the way, to be thoroughly wiped off the face of the earth. I'll be with him to make sure his life is extinguished. Loomis's words hit home with Lori sitting in her car, taking swigs of alcohol and seriously considering giving everything up to finally do exactly what Loomis wanted all this time and killing this motherfucker. Lori will lose her life either way, it seems. She could finally end Michael and probably die in the process, or let the bus go and have definitely wasted her life on nothing. Curtis's performance is intense. I never thought I'd see this kind of emotional payoff in the series. This scene feels like a culmination of both Donald Pleasance's and Jamie Lee Curtis's work in the series. Their two characters, who barely interacted with each other, are tragically linked forever through the actions of this killer, a guy who's never even spoken spoken to either of them. Add to this the chilling, foreboding score of John Carpenter, and this scene is a true highlight of the series for me. Nobody even dies in this scene. That's saying something. It needs to die. It needs to die. Of course, the bus crashes and Michael gets free. Didn't see that coming. I really didn't. I thought this was going to be the one Halloween movie where everything goes fine. And I really wanted to see what Glass Hill is like, too. The wreck is discovered by two unrelated characters, a father and son, going hunting. I really love spending time with you, but right now, dancing is my thing, you know, and 
It really hits me in the heart. I think it's safe to say that Danny McBride wrote that dialogue. What makes this scene pretty notable, after the dad checks out the wrecked bus by himself, is that it involves a very young teen alone in the dark with a bunch of loons wandering around and some bodies scattered about. This is the first real horror scene in the flick with a newly introduced character, but it brings with it a lot of tension right away, especially since Michael isn't even established as being around. You just know he's somewhere. Run. Even with the rifle to defend himself, the scene still concerns a kid without the most solid composure, as evidenced by him immediately shooting Sartain on sight, LA cop style. And eventually, Michael just fucking ruthlessly kills this kid. <laughs> It always felt like, with kids, the series definitely pulled its punches. The comics did kill kids, and I guess when Jamie died, she was technically supposed to be 15, but played by a 20-year-old. But still, kids were usually out of the question as victims in these films. <laughs> This bus scene was a good way to establish Michael as a killer again today, because then you're left wondering, really, what is he capable of doing in this new continuity? Is he gonna kill a fucking baby? No, but I almost thought he was. It just adds a new layer of tension to this long-running horror character, really. I mean, Freddy's never shown on-screen killing anybody not played by an actor in their 20s, even though that's supposed to be his whole fucking thing, killing kids. It's just a nice new territory. Okay, Mike's now got a car from that scene, that's more conspicuous than a bloody prison bus, but he still needs his mask and, ideally, a jumpsuit. I mean, Michael can't be wearing white, it's after Labor Day. So now we come upon Michael having to wipe out a whole lot of folks at a service station just to get his hands on his favorite fashion statement, a jumpsuit. And of course, the podcasters are filling up their podcasting mobile at the very same station. I mean, Michael was stalking them a bit. He even fucked Dana in the shower in a deleted scene that I can understand was deleted. It just wasn't in character. Still, having such a neat and tidy confluence of shit that Michael needs is a bit of a plot contrivance to me. And this film has a few of those, the worst of which comes later. Also, this gas station scene feels the most like a blatant remix of the gas station scene from Halloween 4, and that really fucking pointless rest stop scene from Halloween H2O. There are a few clear homages to past films, sure, like the masks from Halloween 3, Allison's off-screen teacher being played by P.J. Souls, ironically. He said, fate took a different course. And the housewife Michael kills, resembling the housewife he didn't kill in Halloween 2, but this gas station scene really stands out to me as a little too close to its inspirations for comfort. Of course, Michael does a lot of killing, and his main target is the podcasters, and the scene where the shape targets Dana is very suspenseful. Excuse me, sir. someone's in here. Michael dropping the freshly killed mechanic's teeth in the stall is a trademark weird thing that Michael would do. It's a well done, brutal scene that mixes showing violence with Aaron's head being used as a battering ram, and not showing violence when Dana is throttled. A very effective scene overall, another good example of how David Gordon Green and his cinematographer Michael Simmons nailed the feel of the original Halloween while updating it, but eh, narrative wise, I feel like killing the podcasters at least this early was a mistake. I mean, sure, kill Dana. But maybe they could have kept Aaron alive, even for a sequel, and do more with him, have his perspectives on the boogeyman changed, you know, a character arc, I guess. And perhaps Aaron did survive, it seemed pretty open-ended, so hopefully it turns out the character will be brought back in some capacity. He could even fill the role of asshole selling a book that Rob Zombie pushed on Loomis. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Well, whatever. Michael gets his mask, and all is right with the world. I actually like this film's mask quite a bit. Might even be my second favorite mask behind the original. Even though 2 had the original mask supposedly, there was still something a little off with it. The hair was too neat, face too puffy, looked a little too much like William Shatner today. This mask just feels pretty close to the original mask's face and hair, but aged without the overuse of wrinkles and tears of the remake mask. The actual original mask is aged far 
far more drastically in reality, looking like a dehydrated Gary Busey. The new mask keeps to a more solid structure without severe damage. It almost looks like the mask has aged like an actual person ages, reflecting itself as Michael's true face. I also really appreciate the puncture hole in the neck from Lori's stab in the first flick. The effects guys did their homework indeed. So Michael's on the loose, and eventually the police catch on to this and are actually fully aware of what he's capable of. They just don't seem to do much. But hey, what are we gonna do? Castle Halloween? You could at least warn people. The Sheriff of Haddonfield is young, he has this cowboy persona, and probably isn't used to this kind of danger in his town, but he kind of just disappears at a certain point, and I'm not totally clear if he ever took Michael Myers seriously. It just seems like a mild concern to him. I don't even think he's trying to cover this up to stop a panic. It seems like he doesn't give a shit. We have one order of business. That's to hunt this thing down. Still, with how fast news can get out now, especially with social media, I'm surprised this film doesn't really address Haddonfield citizens becoming aware that a murderer is on the loose, becoming more vigilant over the course of the film. It just seems like few people know about the murders, like they're happening in a vacuum, or nobody gives much of a shit. Except Laurie, of course, who gets a late start but is on top of things immediately. The police of Haddonfield might as well have a Laurie Strode signal up in the sky when this shit is happening. Of course, there is the other somewhat competent character, Officer Hawkins, played by Will Patton, who was apparently the guy who stopped Loomis from killing Michael and arrested the shape that fateful night in 78. Yeah, that was maybe a bad move. You know I was there that night. I was there. Honestly, I feel like it doesn't mean much to say that this character did that. I know they were going to do a flashback, but didn't because they didn't want to have Loomis killed. You don't know what death is. But I really think they should have at least shown this new character as a young man performing the arrest to make him a bit more significant alongside the other characters. It would just have a bit more impact and potentially show the remorse he apparently has about not killing Michael all those years ago. Where is this killer? We gotta find him. I'm not gonna stand in the way of justice this time. I mean, the guy's established playing a Back to the Future pinball game and getting a slushy. Yo, Hawkins, would you like a strawberry slushy or a blue raspberry slushy? You'll just bring me a coffee, will you? I'll get you back later. Which does show how inactive the town must normally be, but I don't know. Hawkins is a neat idea, but I feel like he's another one of those missed opportunities. He kind of just gives the police force a face when they're too tied up in bureaucracy to properly handle the situation like loose cannon Laurie. Frank, what are we doing? We don't need your help right now, Laurie. You're just standing here. Please do something. Really though, one of the shining areas of Halloween is seeing classic Michael Myers on the loose in Haddonfield again. The introductory extended tracking shots of Michael wandering around is fantastic. It's like Michael's a kid in a candy store assessing all the possible victims, and you get this almost unedited look into Michael's process. It mostly just seems like he acts on a whim. He sees an opening and he moves on it immediately. No hesitation, never misses a step in all this time. That's what really makes Michael scary. He's a murder machine. Ending a whole ass person's life is just a routine that he doesn't have to think about. He'll kill a person, find a knife, and then just move on on to the next victim. Nick Castle, the original shape, doesn't play Michael Myers for most of the flick, besides the cameo shot where Laurie sees Michael again in a window and, after shooting what turns out to be a mirror, it switches to James Jude Courtney as a torch pass. Nick Castle was an advisor on set though, and it definitely shows in James Jude Courtney's performance. I feel like this Michael is the closest to the original in a long time while still having a new vibe. Like the shape's humanity has eroded even more in all this time, so now he's much more of a hollow out murderous automaton in the form of flesh and bone. Going off topic, but I really gotta give kudos to Michael Simmons' cinematography on this film. Halloween 2018 is a lovely looking horror movie to be sure. I feel like most of the Halloween sequels try to imitate Dean Cundey's look in the first movie, but this flick kinda just does its own thing visually, which is established from the very beginning at Smith's Grove. It's this stark white sanitary environment that's built up slowly with all these various shots of different aspects of the facility, from the 
prisoners to the staff and all the way down to the technical inner workings of the sanitarium. A strong sense of place is established before any of the characters are actually introduced and the way it's all organically cut together makes for an elegant natural viewing experience. This visual approach really complements the actual horror in this film. As Michael's presence and handiwork is slowly established, it builds up anticipation and unease leading up to Michael's kills. Most importantly, the flick flourishes on Halloween night because it firmly establishes Haddonfield as a prime environment for Michael to exist in. The suburbs are set up as a dark labyrinth of fences, trees, and clotheslines that interconnect and lead into more open and unlocked doors than a killer could ever really need. It's just a perfect world for a slasher like Michael to exist in, with plenty of potential for inventive gimmicks like the motion detecting light leading up to Oscar's death. You really don't know where Michael might pop up next, unless you were spoiled by the trailer and know it's the closet. Fuck. And then they ruin it with having her slip afterwards. In summary, so we can fucking wrap this shit up and talk about the finale, Laurie and Hawkins kind of partner up as a crack team of old people looking for a particularly ornery old person. <laughs> Michael coincidentally kills most of Allison's friends, but she ends up finding safety quickly. Back in the 70s, nobody gave a shit about Jamie Lee Curtis in danger. Kids today have it so easy. Fucking millennials. So Lori takes her daughter and son-in-law to the safest place to hide. No, not police headquarters, you fucking idiot. Lori didn't spend all that money on spotlights and surveillance cameras to not use her own fucking house, okay? He waited for this night. He's waited for me. I've waited for him. So Hawkins, and for some reason, not Lori, intercepts Allison and they're all on their way to rendezvous at the Strode residence and wait for everything to just blow over. Except Hawkins spots old Michael and decides to Ben Tramer the guy's ass. Well, I guess Michael's as good as dead, right? Not exactly. Here's where the movie gets all twisty McDeus ex machina on our asses. A gunshot wound recovering Dr. Sartain tags along with Hawkins and decides to pull a fucking Brutus on the officer. This is where my asshole was really clenching in the theater. Like, this could have gotten really weird. This could have been the point where it turned out that there were multiple Michaels, no real Michael, a Michael Myers cult, or even a reveal of Dr. Sartain being the Emperor Palpatine to Michael's Darth Vader. Just a lot of dumb possibilities with Sartain's betrayal. Well, thankfully, it just turns out that Sartain is a huge Michael Myers stan. These people want to kill this man, but the crimes you observed. <laughs> The most important opportunity to understand the mind of evil, you see. The Doc is obsessed with Michael Myers and is an inversion of his mentor, Dr. Loomis. Sartain wants to help Michael, see how he operates when he kills, understand how he thinks at any cost. I want to know what he's feeling. I want to know what pleasure he gets out of killing. It's an interesting idea, but Sartain kind of diminishes Michael Myers' image as a capable villain. It's assumed that Sartain helped Michael escape, so it means it really was likely that Michael Myers would never escape again otherwise. And what was stopping Sartain from helping Michael escape at any other point in the past 40 years? Was he just interested in seeing elderly Michael Myers kill people? Sartain also makes it seem like Michael would be kind of screwed without a sidekick to bail him out. I think Sartain is yet another missed opportunity because we barely get to know the character before the twist is revealed. I feel like it would have had more impact in a sequel, whilst allowing Michael to do a lot more on his own in the meantime. Instead, they're fucking saving Cameron the Pudding Boy for the sequel. Well, at least the Sartain fiasco is short-lived. When Sartain traps Allison in the back of Hawkins' cruiser during a drive, Allison tries to convince Sartain to set her free in exchange for telling the doc the secret word Michael supposedly said to her. What was the word? Fuck! This provides Allison an opportunity to flee, and also provides Michael an opportunity to actually kill his psychiatrist for once. Say something. <laughs> what? Is his head a water balloon filled with chili? Yeah, I don't really like the Sartain death. It's neat gore, but it's just a little too over the top for a Halloween flick, I think. I feel like most of the gore in the film is handled very well, though. Especially the subsequent kills of the goofy cops, displaying Michael's sixth sense of humor and carving one of their heads up like a jack-o'-lantern. So yeah, Michael and Allison are all in proximity of the Strode house. Apparently, Lori was just chilling out with her daughter all this time, getting closer to her and shit. 
Yeah, only when they're about to die does Lori give her daughter motherly affection. And apparently Ray just decides he wants to die, I guess. <laughs> And even though Allison is shown running off in the woods away from the Strode house for the longest time, she still somehow manages to wind up in her grandma's backyard, ironically filled with a bunch of mannequins that resemble the dude that's been trying to kill her that night. <laughs> Yes indeedy, this is the finale, and even with all the plot contrivances, it's still a very satisfying climax. It's Laurie versus Michael, and after all these years, they're evenly matched, and it was in this sequence, after Laurie blows Michael's fingers off like he's rolling the Shane, that it really clicked for me how scary and intense this incarnation of Michael is. As Laurie hunts him down through her own home, Michael owns the shadows, uses diversionary tactics, and I'm guessing Laurie really wishes she hadn't cluttered a room with mannequins for him to hide in. Actually, why would Lori live in a house that's larger than necessary with plenty of places for a killer to hide in? <sighs> Still, the movie shows that after all this time living with Michael in her head, Lori has become like Michael in a lot of ways, a predator, even cheating death. This is a great message vital to the film, how victims can become stronger through their trauma and finally overcome it all. It's surprisingly uplifting for a horror film. Ultimately, Michael finds Karen and Allison cornered in the basement, Karen aims to defend her daughter with the rifle intended for her, but she's too overwhelmed by fear, which Michael takes full advantage of. I'm sorry, I can't do it! Except Karen takes advantage of Michael's taking advantage of fear and fucking shoots him. Gotcha. <laughs> Of course, not in the head. Happy Halloween, Michael. Then Michael gets his ass kicked into a sealed shut basement, and the true purpose of Lori's isolated home finally becomes clear to Karen. It's not a cage, baby. It's a trap. So, with the toss of a flare into a gas-flooded basement, Michael is condemned to a tomb of flames as the trio of Strode gals flee to safety. Now, originally, Lori was supposed to die in the process of saving her babies, and that would be a satisfying end to the character, but... At the same time, I feel like Lori has earned a chance at a family after all she sacrificed. There's plenty of opportunity for her to die later. Let her spend some time getting to know her granddaughter, come on. So the film ends on a bright note, but concludes the way the series began, with a bloody knife. So that was my mega review of Halloween 2018. I do have a lot of issues with the film, but at the end of the day, I still really like this sequel. It did more right by me than bad, and you know, you can dislike stuff in a movie and still like the movie overall. I feel like some people get a little too hung up on wanting to either absolutely love something or absolutely hate something. Like, they're incapable of accepting any flaws in their media. The flick has a lot of plot contrivances for sure, and there are some underdeveloped characters, missed opportunities, and it definitely rehashes elements from past Halloween films, but I came out of that theater not worrying about the flaws too much because I was thoroughly entertained and satisfied by everything else. It felt like the film was made by fans who really gave a shit about Halloween and were trying their best to make a film that carries the series forward and does the original justice. The cast was good, especially Jamie Lee Curtis. The film looks great, it has a very tense atmosphere, an amazing score, and Michael Myers, despite his age, felt rejuvenated. I came out of the theater with a big grin. I was very pleased with this flick, and I still appreciate the respectful effort put in the film, and I think it might have a shot at being my favorite Halloween sequel in the long run. The film's name simply being Halloween makes sense after all to me. It's still a sequel to the original, but it's also a new start for the franchise. Now, if the $250 million at the box office on a $10 million budget and talk of a sequel being in development didn't make it clear enough, Laurie's basement is shown sans Michael, as if he supernaturally disappeared once again into the night. And he's even heard breathing at the end of the credits, so yeah, he's probably coming back. It wouldn't be the first time he survived being burned alive. It might be a different Michael, but age or no, he can still do all the same shit. Or maybe they'll do something different, I don't know. Thing is, old Michael worked here, but it may not work out so well in subsequent films as time goes on, so a future sequel might want to address this in some way. I just hope that David Gordon Green and Danny McBride stick around for the sequel. From what I've heard, apparently somebody else might be writing the next Halloween, but I really do want a consistent creative vision for the new films. 
I've seen too often a new creative team jump into this series and totally disrupt what was started in the previous film. I really hope Green builds up on what was begun with this flick. It'd be a shame if another attempt at a timeline gets fucked up yet again. At the end of the day, after all, I do want to see the series continue while hopefully ironing out the kinks of this latest movie, and if it sucks, oh well, I still have the original and the sequels I do enjoy. I'm not one of those pathetic, you ruined my childhood dickheads that Disney has to see comments from while simultaneously getting money from with every movie they release. No, no, please give me more Halloween movies and a season of the Witch spin-off anthology series and a Nightmare on Elm Street movie with Robert England and a million dollars. Let's do this, Blumhouse. I give 2018's Halloween a revised rating of rifle-wielding grandma out of a knife-wielding longshoreman. Oh boy, this movie was totally able to make me forget for 90 minutes that Jamie Lee Curtis has since become the spokeswoman for yogurt that helps you shit. That's quite the achievement. If you like this video, like it, but if you loved it, subscribe for more and click that fucking bell. Follow my social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula to keep in touch and chuckle at some horror memes I make. Also, consider pledging to my Patreon for updates, early access, exclusive streams, and voice chats with me, Doc. Before I go, I just want to give a shout out to some of my platinum supporters on Patreon. So thank you to Fancy Alchemist Guy, Mr. Maskey, Reckless, Harley Graves, Caleb, Sean O'Brien, Ryan, Henry Massonet, Willie Grills, Alec Poor, Gary Miller, Chuttles, Crawberry Strush, Nate Malice, Crossroad King, Lou Mayle, and Serafina. Seriously, thank you all for supporting me while I made this giant size review. And here's a full list of my platinum supporters on Patreon. Videos like this wouldn't be possible without their contributions, so I'm seriously grateful for their support, along with the support of all of my patrons. Thanks a bunch, guys. I've been your host, Dr. Wolfula, signing out. See you next time. I got peanut butter on my penis. Ew, Dad.